Hey everybody, welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Today we're gonna have a special Eddie Van Halen tribute show. I was fortunate to have a few, uh, what happened was basically uh, several listeners had emailed me and asked me to put on a, you know, this Eddie Van Halen tribute show and I was fortunate, I was able to reach out to a few players who've been on the show before and I got them to put together their own personal testimony and tell some Eddie stories uh, the first time they heard Eddie or how he influenced their music. And many of them had personal interactions with Eddie and, and some cool experiences. So I think you'll enjoy this. A few comments. Uh, first of all, thank you, everybody who participated. I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are and things are hectic. And, uh, you know, so just thanks very much for taking the time to do this. Uh, second, uh, each one of these people have been prior guests on the show. If you want to check out their original episode, you can do that a few different places. You can go audio wherever you listen to podcasts and just type in their name and everyone loves guitar and it'll pop up. You can go to the website, everyone loves guitar.com, or you can go to our YouTube channel and just enter their name and the same thing will happen. Also the show is presented uh, to avoid any kind of biases. It's just alphabetized by last names. So that's how the show is going to run. If you look on the YouTube video, the chapters or the time of each episode is there. So if there's a particular player you want to listen to first, you can do that on YouTube. Also, uh, forgive me for some of the volume discrepancies. Again, this was put together pretty quick and I didn't have a ton of time to do probably the proper editing that it needed. So especially on the audio, you're going to hear some volume discrepancies. I'm just letting you know that in advance and I'm asking you to uh, please bear with me and I appreciate your help. And uh, also, again, big thanks to everybody who participated and uh, it's a terrible loss for the guitar community. I mean, when I first heard Eddie Van Halen, I wasn't playing guitar, but I knew right away that, man, this is the first guy, this guy is changing guitar, ever, first person to do that since Hendrix, and I don't think anybody's really done that ever since, so thank you for listening, and uh, if you have any comments, just put them underneath the video, or, if, or uh, if you're listening to the audio, please feel free to email us in, and uh, as always, appreciate your time and support, and rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen. Hey, everybody, this is Dave Amato from Ario Speedwagon. And I'm here to talk about uh, Eddie Van Halen. Uh, what an amazing influence he was on my guitar plan. And uh, I, I came from Boston and uh, I wanted to come out to LA because it was, uh, everything was happening in the like 1980s and the 80s. And uh, I came out here for a visit one time and I, I went to the, uh, the Starwood and uh, Van Halen was playing and, and there was a bunch of other bands like that but but Eddie was just uh just amazing to me and um I went back to Boston and uh you know because he he had like a strap type of thing on like a Kramer he made his own his own guitar with a, a, a Floyd Rose on it it was a tremolo system that I just had like Fender Strats or maybe just stock Gibsons but he had this tremolo system that was on his guitar and it just did amazing acrobatic things with and just, I, I thought, man, I got to get one of those, whatever it was at the time. And, you know, I found out later, of course, it was a Floyd Rose. And um, I went back to Boston and I had my, my uh, Strat and I just like almost broke the, the bar off of it watching Eddie, you know, do his acrobatics and, you know, just dive bombs and to pull it up and these harmonics and just, it just influenced the heck out of me. And I just wanted to do that. And, um, and I, I took it, I, and I moved back to L.A., and uh, I found out and asked more questions what Eddie had on his guitar was Floyd Roses. So I started putting Floyd Roses on Stratocasters, which he kind of had, and uh, it was just an amazing uh, uh, a thing for a guitar player to, to have on your guitar because it, it locked at the top and it locked at the bottom, and it just was just, you know, it stayed in tune. You could dive bomb it way down there and then came up and it was then all in tune. And it was just an amazing, you know, thing, uh, contraption that he, you know, had on his, on his first guitarist. And that was it. And his playing, of course, with that thing was just, just amazing. His tapping ability and I, like everybody wanted to tap and, and, and uh, it just his tone as absolutely and it was essential too with Marshall amplifiers because I was playing Marshall amps. And I just wanted to get that tone and uh, just kind of emulate what he was doing at the time. And it, it ended up being um, 
you know, the influence from that and on a Strat went to uh, Gibson later on in, in my dealings with Gibson guitars and Les Pauls. I always wanted to have that, that tremolo on a Les Paul. So I kept saying to, to Gibson, I, I want to see, I got to have a Floyd Rose on a, on a Les Paul, you know, because um, I wanted to have that, that, um, that, you know, uh, so I could do it on Les Paul. And it, it, and it came out to be my, um, my signature model when uh, Gibson uh, contacted me, they wanted to do a signature, signature model with it. And it's called the Access. And it's my model, the Dave Amato Access with, of course, the Floyd Rose on that, which came from basically stemming from Eddie uh, on that, because I wanted to have the, um, the uh, uh, freedom of having a, a, a tremolo system that would stay in tune, a locking nut up the top and locking here. And basically that, that all came from, from Eddie, you know, it just came in my mind in the eighties and, and it just stemmed from this guitar. And I have another excess model that has a Floyd Rose on it. It's just so much fun to have, um, you know, the, the ability to do that on a, on a Les Paul and, you know, with his playing, uh, with his tapping, I just, just wanted me practice more and just, um, you know, learn more things and stretch out some more and, and uh, it was just an amazing, amazing time in the 80s when, when Eddie was there with Van Halen. Amazing songs, you know, with Ross singing and um, just influenced the heck out of me. And I just took it, you know, and used it in my um, life, you know, in my guitar playing for that. And I used to see him. And also he had an amazing like Bradshaw rig. He has these big tall Bradshaw rigs, a Marshall head and a Bradshaw, you know, pedal board. And I sold my soul to get a Bradshaw, <laughs> Bradshaw um, rack. And I used to, I, I kind of got to know Bob and I used to see Eddie over there and he used to be fixing, you know, Bob used to be in, inside his rack and, and be soldering stuff. And I used to be drooling. I sold my soul to get a Bradshaw rig. And I used to see Eddie over there. This was, uh, probably early 80s, mid, mid 80s. It's to see, uh, and Eddie's over there like a noon time, and there he's, you know, Eddie's telling him, I want this, and you know, ultra harmonizer and even tide. And he's the, uh, and uh, of course, I emulated that too with uh, Eddie's Bradshaw rig. I wanted to get a Bradshaw rig, which I still have to this day, I have a bunch of them. And uh, Bob turned into my friend, but that all stemmed from from Eddie Van Halen, you know, with equipment wise and playing wise, a big big influence in my guitar, uh, you know, playing. I'm not sure if I have the same style as Eddie, but I incorporated some of his his uh, techniques, or or, or uh, you know, especially with the Floyd Rose tremolo on some of my Les Pauls, you know. So, but um, yeah, I know Ed, Eddie a little bit from from Bob, and then I used to see him when Sammy joined. I used to go see Sammy because I knew kind of Sammy afterwards, and uh, I used to see him on on the road with Van Halen when Sammy was there too. I used to say hi to Eddie, and 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 Eddie was a a great guy amazing player, amazing influence on me and my life as a guitar player. And I'm sure with everybody else that I know, it's just um, his guitar playing emulated with, with everybody that, that I know in, in different ways. You know, it just picked up certain things from Eddie and took them and used them, you know, or stole them, <laughs> whatever. And, uh, and it was just, uh, I'm sorry to see he's gone. It's just, a, it's just a shame that, you know, he had the cancer and he's gone. It's, it's, a, it's a blow to the guitar nation. How's it going, everyone? Uh, I am Zach Blair, and I play guitar in the band Rise Against. And um, I guess I'm here, as with everybody else, uh, talking about the influence that Eddie Van Halen had on all of us if we play electric guitar uh, at any capacity, on any level. Um, I don't think uh, anything I can say or anyone else can say can encapsulate exactly just how important um, he is or was, unfortunately, to what it is we do and to if anyone forever picks up the electric guitar. Um, I think it's safe to say there was Les Paul, um, you know, Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, and then... Eddie Van Halen, as far as importance to rock and roll guitar. Um, 
you know, to compare it to any other field, Michael Jordan or Babe Ruth or, you know, he redefined everything. He reinvented how to play it and everyone after him tried to play like him. There's no way you could be a person that came up in the genre I did, which was punk rock, and somehow he, his influence permeates. There's just no getting away from it. There's no... And I remember when I was a kid, I was a little young when uh, all the great, you know, early Van Halen records were coming out. Van Halen 1, 2, Diver Down, Women and Children First, uh, 1984. Uh, but the big kids in the late 70s were like, you know, the kids that would go out in the woods and like smoke pot and hang out or hang out at their cars. That's what they listened to. It was just the music of that era. If you're a guy that was born in the 70s or a girl born in the 70s, that that was your music. And definitely if you ended up being a musician, and absolutely if you ended up being a rock and roll musician. Um, I was more of a day fan. I will readily admit that wholeheartedly. Um, nothing to take away from the Sammy Hagar years, but uh, and those were some great songs as well. But there's just something about it. I think it was just at the right time. It hit me at the right time. I was at the right age. Um, and I remember hearing Unchained for the first time and just thinking that was the greatest riff I'd ever heard in my life. And I think it is still to this day. So, unfortunately, I can't believe I'm having to do some sort of virtual eulogy for Eddie Van Halen. He just seemed like one of those people that was going to outlive us all no matter what. And that would be influencing us well into all of our older years. Um, I never personally met him. Um, we played on the same festivals certain times, but not on certain days. And honestly, I don't know what I would have said to him if I had. The closest I got is we played with um, Sammy Hagar's band, The Circle, that had Michael Anthony. And I stood on the side of the stage and teared up when they played Van Halen songs, just hearing one quarter of the guy, the, the, the band that, that made those songs, um, those backing vocals, the Michael Anthony, perfect pitch, crazy high backing vocals, and just thinking of, you know, this is the guy. So just being that close to somebody that was that close to the man got me emotional. Uh, so I really don't know what I would have said to Eddie Van Halen himself. Uh, you know, needless to say, he had a huge impact on me and my life uh, with what I've chosen to do, uh, which is a prof being a professional guitar player. Um, and it's just a tr sad, tragedy, tragic thing. But what an amazing uh, accomplishment and experience that we got to have in Eddie Van Halen and all of our lives in the first place. And you know, once in a lifetime, somebody comes along and redefines the genre and gives us something to aspire to, to strive toward and to be like, or to influence us to do ourselves and to, to do it in our own voice. So um, as feeble a gesture it is uh, from Zach Blair of Rise Against, thank you, Eddie Van Halen. Hey everybody, it's Doug Bossy, um, just sharing in the morning and the mutual uh, round table here of talking about the great, late, great Eddie Van Halen. I want to read a quote. Um, the greatness of this genius, unequaled, unsurpassed, precludes even the idea of a successor. No one will be able to follow in his footsteps. No name will equal in his glory. That was written about Paganini, the violinist, in the 17th century, and really could apply to to Eddie, um, I come from the generation, there were so many musicians that I worked with like Greg and Matt Bissonette or Kenny Arnoff, a lot of guys saw the Beatles on TV and that was their aha moment. And then I was too young for the Zeppelin sort of thing. So I've come from the generation like so many of you guys out there that heard that first Van Halen record and was like, what was that, you know? So uh, that's what got me to play the guitar, changed my entire life. Like many of you, uh, Eddie changed your life um, just from, and the band, just from the music and wanting to do that. And he was just smiling and made it look so fun and easy, like he, you know, was effortless. So 
uh, I just want to share my Eddie Van Halen stories because everybody's got some. Um, of course, I was a huge fan. Never thought I'd ever meet him. But I moved to L.A. I uh, was out in L.A. for about 30 years. And within the first couple of years, I met a friend named uh, uh, Robbie Wyckoff, who you guys might have seen on the show. And um, he introduced me to a great guy named Matty Brock, Matt Brock. And Matt was uh, playing baseball one day, and all these musicians were playing baseball. He met Eddie Van Halen became Eddie's tech, and then uh, eventually became his manager. And if Maddie's watching this, man, I just want to say, I, I'm so sorry, um, condolences. Um, but Eddie, uh, Matt called me one day and said, hey, I've got this band I'm doing called Custom 500. Do you want to come up to 5150? We're going to do some recording up here. And I went, uh, yeah, you know. So I get up to uh, 5150, I'm walking in, I'm like, oh my God, I'm at Eddie Van Halen's house. Eddie wasn't there that day. but. Um, a junior came over and played some drums. It was some really cool music. Got to record in that studio and on the neck, on the wall were all these guitar necks. And he showed me the neck that did the first two records. And I got to touch the neck and he showed me the amp, the holy grail of amps, you know, the, the Marshall and got over there and I'm like, wow. And there was all these, you know, Eddie Van Halen was kind of like Thomas Edison. There was all these other amps, boxes, fenders, tubes, everything all over. You know, it was like a mad studio. Uh, he was always tinkering with stuff and trying different combinations. So one of his great achievements, besides all the music, was, you know, I'm, I'm putting up his, you know, you can, I mean, how many bands can you identify with like a, a visual brand? You know, I mean, he made, he had such style, the fact, the way he painted his guitars. And, uh, but he was such a, an overall a genius, you know. So anyway, so I'm there. It was a, just amazing. Alex Van Halen pulls up. I get to meet Alex. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'll never meet Eddie. But that was cool, you know. So a couple of years ago, about 10 years go by, and I'm at Hollywood and Vine at the, the big mall there uh, where the Kodak Theater is. And I'm, I'm going down to my car towards the area where you ballet. And it's just me. And the valet pulls up and there's Eddie Van Halen with two bags of stuff he'd been shopping. And I'm like, Eddie Van Halen? You know, so it's one of these weird, you know, just like I couldn't believe it was him. I kind of blurted his name out. He's like, hey, what's up, man? So I I, uh, I started telling my new man, Brock, and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, cool, cool, man. He reaches in his pocket, hands me a guitar pick. And uh, and then he gets into the, you know, it's like a movie, a movie scene. He gets into this super hot rod and uh, I think it was a Porsche, one of his many cars. And you know, pulls out. I'm like, I just met Eddie Van Halen. So that was my Eddie story. I got to meet him and got to shake his hand and just you know thank him for changing my world. And and uh, I just want to send condolences to everybody out there that knew him, met him, and uh, he's changed my whole world. So Eddie Van Halen, thank you for the music and uh, your genius will live on. <laughs> Thanks, Steph. So one more quick note about Eddie Van Halen I want to mention. That's a really important one. Uh, when everybody was flipping out about Eddie, myself included, in the guitar magazines were the only source of information. Eddie, Eddie was asked, who are your favorite, favorite players? Of course, he mentioned uh, Eric Clapton, but he mentioned this guy, Alan Holdsworth. None of us knew who Alan Holdsworth were. So we all started looking up UK, Bill Bruford, and then everybody flipped out on Alan Holdsworth. Alan had already done IOU, I believe, at that point, came to California was almost ready to give up music from what I heard because uh, he was just not making a living. And it was Eddie that went to Ted Templeton and got him a deal at Warner Brothers and did that incredible record, Road Games. Um, although Eddie, did, uh, Alan didn't like the record because it was too much control. That's a whole other story. But it, the most important thing was Eddie brought Alan, supported Alan to the, to, to the masses, so to speak. And for that, that we are all you know pretty pretty grateful because it allowed Alan to have a career after that. And uh, you know, Alan and Eddie even jammed at one point. Uh, there's some recording on YouTube if you check it out. But you know, Eddie said, uh, "I can I can pretty much hear any other guitar player in the world and figure out what they're doing pretty quick. But when I hear Alan Holsworth, I can't. I don't know what he's doing." So that was that was pretty incredible. So it's a side note. Hi, I'm Phil Collin. Um, I know this is such a sad occasion. I can't get over this myself. But um, yeah, we're talking about Eddie and the amazing impact he had on uh, musicians, influences on guitar players and, and everything. You know, it wasn't just the guitar playing, obviously. However, he was a, um, one of the most major influences ever. You know, Jimi Hendrix, you know, there's Hendrix in the 60s and then, then Eddie Van Halen. So anyone who plays electric guitar 
would, would know about those two and what an impact they had. Um, wasn't, I, I think when I first heard Eddie, it sounded like you know, someone could fly. Someone was literally like Superman. They were doing this stuff that was amazing. The feel was incredible. It was like just firepower and you know, just um, the technique was obviously amazing, but the vibrato was just out of this world. Everything about it was what you wanted to hear in a, in a guitar player. And um, it was singing, and he was doing things, you know, obviously the tapping and all these other things, it just made everything work for him. So that's why it was so influential, you know, it's, um, so it's not often someone comes along and, and just makes you want to play guitar, but uh, with Eddie, it really made me want to play guitar. And obviously the, the other impact he had was actually on the guitar itself. Um, you know, he would take a hacksaw or a file or a chisel, he'd chop something out that he didn't like and, and change it, you know. Um, my guitars that I play today, the, the Jackson PC1 and, and the Supreme, they're, they're actually based on, a, on an Eddie thing, which was getting a Fender Strat or a Strat type guitar and making a hybrid of it. So you, I mean, back then it was like, I want it to sound like a Les Paul, but I want it to feel like a Strat and I want to use the whammy bar, but it goes out of tune and all this stuff. And uh, Eddie kind of fixed that, you know, he, he actually got a guitar and he rubbed the back of the neck off. So it was like, it was just cool to play, just natural. And it became part of you. Um, and that was the wonderful thing about Eddie, where if you ever saw him play, it was like, he is the guitar and the guitar is him. So um, he, he brought that, all of that to, to all of us really, you know, just putting the humbucker in a strat and just like the Floyd Rose, the, the lock-in thing, and just, you can go crazy on it. My, my guitars are still, the Strat hybrid that, that he kind of brought in. Um, you know, I have fat and necks on my guitars, they've got Dimarzios. Me and Eddie both used um, FU Tone parts, you know, titanium, Ad Adam Revere had these uh, replacement parts that make the guitar sound bigger. So he was constantly kind of up in the game of the guitar, not just the playing, but the actual tool that he used to, to get that. And um, I love that, you know, um, I, I met him I, I just very briefly, a couple of times, like in a, in a toilet once, you know, hey, Ed, hey, Phil, how's it going? And, and the first time I met him was on Van Halen's first headline tour of, of the UK. I was in a band called Girl. And um, we, we got back to see him and uh, I was talking to Eddie and I had this Fender Strat that was a, a gift for, for, from my mum on my 21st birthday. Um, and I, I really, I knew that it should have a humbucker because I was, I, was, I couldn't quite get it. I was using fuzz boxes and that. You know, I wanted to sound like Richie Blackmore, which was like kind of cool, but I really wanted the Eddie thing. And I met, met him when I was talking to him. I said, I've got this Strat. And he said, you know, you're never going to be happy with that guitar until you kind of put a humbucker in that, right? I was like, <laughs> so I did. So I went and got it fixed. Uh, and that guitar, actually, I still play today. And it was the main guitar on, on the Hysteria album. So anytime you hear, any of them songs, you know, Rock It, Pour Some Sugar On Me, Armageddon, Animal Love Bites, that's on there. Um, and it was this uh, black strat that we hacked away before DiMarzio and it had like, a lot of different kind of pickups in it. Um, finally got a Floyd in it because it, it cracked, it broke and all this stuff. And it was, you know, it just kept just getting repaired and, and it, was, it was like one of Eddie's guitars. So uh, it was, it was kind of cool that, that he kind of gave me the okay and, and told me to butcher it in the first place but um yeah it sounds amazing you've heard it and it's it, it was incredible so um we're really going to miss eddie and and the, the playing the influences just just amazing stuff and um and but we've got the sound so we got we got all that stuff to to still listen to hey this is mike dawes one of the many guitar players out there heavily inspired by the late great mr eddie van halen um eddie van halen's music with the band, also on, 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 on the, the Michael Jackson song, Beat It, are essentially the reason I got into playing electric guitar. Uh, that then translated into acoustic guitar later on when I actually saw uh, a great guitar player named Eric Roche uh, playing his cover version of Jump uh, on acoustic in the kind of fingerstyle genre. Um, so I frantically tried to learn that and, and went out and gigged it at the local bars and that then progressed into somewhat of an acoustic guitar based career um based around a lot of two-handed tapping on the acoustic ironically um i remember when i was at school i had to learn beat it and transcribe the solo as a project uh it just his influence has been profound um i never got to see van halen i never got to to meet uh him or, or alex or, or or wolfie or any of those guys um but um 
man, what a what a profound tragedy. Um, he changed the game, uh, not just with his playing and his music, but in his innovations as well on the gear side of things. Um, and that's something that that really can't be overstated. Um, we all own a guitar that has been modified to suit Eddie Van Halen, essentially. Um, yeah, a profound loss, a real tragedy for the community. Um, yeah, time to bust out some old records. Take care. Hey guys, this is Daniel Donato. I've been thinking a lot about Eddie's passing and um, something Eddie's actions and his music prove to us is that if you take chances and you stay honest to yourself and you work harder than anyone else in the room, your legacy will live on. Eddie Van Halen will never die. His music is the most alive as it's ever been. Uh, thank you guys. And stay inspired and stay positive. Hi, this is Rob Garland. I teach guitar at uh, Musicians Institute and for True Fire, play with a couple of bands, Catatonic, my eclectic trio. Um, so I grew up in England and I first heard Eddie Van Halen when I was 14. And that was the time I just started playing guitar. That would have been around the 5150 era. Um, it, it's hard to believe, but there wasn't mainstream rock radio at that time in England. And Van Halen wasn't as high profile as they were in the US. Uh, so most of my school friends were listening to the pop music of the day, you know. And then there's this, these two guys, my best friend and I, who both just started playing guitar, both became obsessed with Van Halen, grew our hair long. We were the outcasts of the, of the school in a little fringe group, you know. Um, and that's amazing in itself because I, I think, you know, if I'd started playing guitar a few years later, let's say when Nirvana was the flavor of the month, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now with a guitar in my hands because if you're introduced to the guitar and your guitar hero is a virtuoso to the level of Eddie Van Halen, it, it, I mean, it inspired a lifetime of dedication to the instrument. Um, so after being introduced to Van Hagar, um, I went back and discovered the early years and fell in love with that. You know, I had my obsessive fair warning period, like many guitar players do. Um, but I was never really interested in the Sammy versus Dave debate. I loved all of it. You know, I loved hearing Eddie play. That, that was it. Um, and as well as the impact of hearing Eddie play on those records, you know, and, and at the time I wouldn't have known the technicalities of what was happening, but there was such, you know, fire in his playing, such soul in his playing. And a lot of, a lot of guys that took on some of the lead techniques afterwards missed that, you know, I mean, there was, it was always soulful. Um, and, and, and it, it moved me, you know, and, and he always played with such intensity, you know, and that was a very, very core lesson. You know, if you're going to play, put everything into it, you know? Um, so I was obsessively watching the live without a net VHS concert tape at the time. And to this day, I know every frame of that video. I watched it so many times. Um, and I think that's the reason why, because of that, I was always drawn to super strap guitars, you know, that's all I've ever played. And uh, most of them had maple necks, you know, because of that video. Uh, another influence that came out of that uh, was how happy and full of joy Eddie and the band looked on stage, you know, at that time, uh, you know, and, and subsequently, plenty of rock bands trying to look cool, looking down at the floor, not acknowledging the audience, trying to be all moody. That didn't work for me, that wasn't cool. Eddie Van Halen was cool, you know, seeing that joy come out of a person playing guitar on stage, there's nothing cooler than that. Um, and also, you know, through the years, all, all of the reports of, of Eddie experimenting with his gear, uh, that rubbed off too, not, not just to do it for the sake of it, but because sometimes you need to overcome limitations of the instrument that work for you. You know, I would take out string trees, pickups, uh, re, re, uh, spring the trim, you know, all kinds of things mess with the amps, just, just, um, because sometimes you're, you're chasing a sound you hear in your head and, and the guitar's not doing it for you. And sometimes, you know, customizing the gear can do that. So that was another thing that came from Ed. One of the most important lessons I learned from Eddie Van Halen is pay attention to your rhythm playing. 
there is no better rock rhythm guitar player than Edward Van Halen. I mean, talk about pocket and groove. And because his lead playing was so revolutionary, sometimes that gets overlooked, but it's just as important, you know, if not more so. So as my musical tastes kind of evolved and diversified through the years, um, Van Halen remained a constant, you know, to this day. I saw the band live every time they came to the UK. Later, after I moved to the US, I saw all the reunion tours. Um, I saw the last tour, 2015, at the Hollywood Bowl. It was an incredible show. I'm so glad I was there for that. Um, Ed was just on fire that night. So now I live in Los Angeles and I hear a lot of really cool stories from people about the early days, you know, people attending the backyard parties, the, the cover gigs on, on the Sunset Strip where Van Halen would just play a couple of originals, you know, uh, and the rest would be covers. Um, another good one is uh, when, um, when Van Halen came to uh, MI or GIT, as it was called then, um, Alan Hosworth was doing a clinic and there was a line of people outside the concert hall waiting for it to start and they sort of parted and Eddie Van Halen comes walking through with his guitar in one hand, a beer in the other, cigarette hanging from his mouth and he, and he went in and jammed with, with Alan. And um, there's an amazing um, black and white photograph on the wall at MI of that day. And uh, I often, when I'm walking through the halls, I often stop and look at it, you know, incredible. Um, so, you know, it's just been a few days I can't stop thinking about the legacy of, of Van Halen. I mean, the, the impact it's had on the, the guitar community is huge, but um, just on a personal note, I just want to say thank you um, for inspiring a 14 year old in a little seaside town in England. And, and you know, it's really strange to think that 30 years later now, I do, I do this for a living and um, I live in the same town <laughs> that, that Eddie Van Halen um, did so I, I'm just grateful we have the music to enjoy you know and once this sort of grief period starts to settle a little bit um, I'm glad that we can all enjoy the music together and celebrate um, all, all the amazing things that uh, Eddie Van Halen did for guitar and music and um, I'll leave you with something Sammy Hagar said once uh, you know what is understood need not be discussed thank you Hi, this is Derry from Honeymoon Suite, and um, I am still reeling from the sad news of the passing of Eddie Van Halen uh, yesterday. Um, I'm in shock, like the rest of the music world is, um, at his at his uh, unfortunate early passing. Um, but at the same time, um, Eddie was was iconic in the world of music and guitar, and he did change the face of guitar, and he was a tremendous, huge influence on my life and my attitude towards songwriting and guitar. And I will never, I'll never forget, uh, you know, what he contributed. Um, I remember as a kid, the first time I heard Eruption, I, I walked into a, a bar in the afternoon where, where I used to live um, when I was a kid. And the DJ put on uh, the first Van Halen record and started with Eruption. And my head snapped around, I'd never heard anything like that in my life. It was just friggin' incredible. And I, he showed me the album that, that it was on, and he says, this new band, Van Halen from California. I went out the next day and I bought the record, and I spun it, you know, a, a, a million times, and I, I looked at the cover, and I was just in awe of, of this guy, because it's like nothing any of us had ever, ever heard before. So I'd been a Van Halen fan since since day one, and not not trying to to be Eddie, because nobody can can play like Eddie, but it certainly influenced me and just brought this this humor back into the guitar and this smile on his face and just everything about Van Halen and David Lee Ross and everything. It just uh, you know every every record um, and it it just influenced me more than any other guitar player to to be in a band and, and to to learn to be a player. So many years, fast forward many years later, I was in a band and I finally got successful with Honeymoon Suite and, and we got our record deal. And um, I remember at that point, uh, we were doing a lot of touring and walking, it's probably about mid eighties. Um, let's see what the timeline was. We were um, 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 
we were in an airport. It was in Toronto where I was living at the time. And we were flying out somewhere uh, to go to, to where God knows, somewhere in the States to play. And I was walking down the, uh, the concourse with my, with my keyboard player. And there's lots of people. And, and Ray turns to me, he goes, hey, Eddie Van Halen just walked by. And I'm like, what? He goes, no, that was Eddie Van Halen. So I turned around and, and, and there he is. He's, he's over, you know, he stopped. He's over by the, uh, you know, the ticket counter. And he was with Alex because they were, they were up in Toronto, actually, because Valerie was shooting a movie up there. And I'm going, holy shit, there, there's Eddie Van Halen. So I went over and uh, uh, the publicist, actually, that was with us, her name was Monica. She was with Warner Brothers. So fortunately, she knew of Eddie and, and she went over and did the intro. So I actually, I actually got to meet him and my, my hand was shaking and, and he couldn't have been nicer. And I just said, Eddie, I'm, I'm a huge fan. You know, we're on Warner Brothers as well. And um, I, I just, you know, wanted to say, say hi. And at that time, they, they just finished 5150 because, uh, you know, uh, David Lee Roth had left and they were, uh, Sammy Hager was in the band and the 5150 was just finished. It hadn't come out yet. So I said, how do you like working with, with Sammy, who I was familiar with growing up? And he goes, oh, man, it's great. We finally got a, a, somebody in the band who can sing, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think him and Dave were on, on the outs, but he was just, uh, you know, over the top about having Sammy in the band. He says, this new fucking record is going to be so good. Wait till you hear it. And I'm like, awesome, man. I, I can't wait. So that's my Van Halen story that like, you know, the one and only time that, that I met Eddie. I mean, I'd see Van Halen seven or eight times, but to actually to actually meet him. And it always catches you off guard. It's in an airport and there he is right there. So you go over and it's like, you're not expecting it. Anyways, I'm glad that, that I got to meet him. So fast forward a few years later, um, we were doing our third album in LA and we'd had Ted, Ted Templeman was the producer. So then there's another Van Halen connection when I heard that we were going to be working with Ted, with you know, Montrose and all the Van Halen records. So that was amazing. And Ted did a great job, um, you know, because he was very guitar, uh, guitar oriented producer. And he, we would sit around after and he'd tell us a lot of you know, Van Halen stories about Alex and Eddie punching each other out in the studio. You know, they didn't always get along, but... Um, he would just, you know, Ted was like, oh, yeah, I mean, I was working with Eddie. And it's like, those guys, I tell you. And then he would have, you know, the behind the console stories of Dave and Eddie. It was pretty funny. Pretty funny. So that's about, you know, that's kind of like my, my Van Halen uh, stories uh, there. And I followed Eddie, you know, and then Sammy left and Sharon came in and then Sammy came back. You know, people have all the thoughts about David Lee Roth and, and Hagar. And people would ask me, you know, what do you think about the singer? And I said, you know what? As long as Eddie's playing guitar, I don't care. I'll buy any record because whatever he plays makes me smile. And I can learn something from that. And I love so many guitar players. But Eddie would, uh, every time he'd come out of record, he'd always come up with something new and something kind of put a smile on my face and inspired me to, to, to play on. Um, not like him because nobody's like him, but it made me want to play guitar more so that's about it thank right god on. he he was on this earth and and what a, a legacy he left behind i'm so so sad that he's gone but there's nothing we can do about that thanks terry hello there friends my name is jeff coleman and uh here today we're talking about the greatness of the legend eddie van halen i like to refer to him as edward king edward and uh an interesting thing happened the morning that he passed you know, you get these news feeds, you know, five years ago, this was happening. It turned out I went to see their last show at the Hollywood Bowl. And then I parlayed that apparently five years ago with playing a show, a private party that he was at and played as well. So I just kind of posted, reposted this, reshared because I'm kind of lazy with social media. And I thought, well, this is one of the coolest days ever, right? You know, playing uh, at the same venue as Eddie Van Halen. And then also the great Hollywood Bowl show. Who knew it was going to be the last show? But as I'm writing this, he hadn't passed away yet, as far as we knew, you know. I got the news five, six hours later. So then I actually went back and edited that post because it sounded like insincere because if people don't know when you put it out, you know, they, they wouldn't get it. It just sounds like I'm promoting playing with him. <laughs> so most of the people got it. They were like, wow, this is really... Uh, you know, ironic, the timing of your post, and then he passed away. Uh, but the crazy thing with Eddie Van Halen is that, you know, 
leading up to it, I'm listening to bootlegs and I'm playing my vinyl record, you know. It's like, I realize like a lot of people, every day is Van Halen and it has been since 1978 for me, you know. So is it ironic? I don't know. I mean, I'm always living and breathing his music, you know, always playing the stuff and trying to play along with it and, you know, mainly listening and absorbing it. So, you know, that's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's such a heartbreaker that it happened. And I got the news. Um, I was doing some TMZ cues with a buddy and my phone started blowing up. Oh my God, Edward, you know, and then I just had to quit the session and, you know, we picked it up like two days later. I went to the beach and bought beer and <laughs> listened to Van Halen. <laughs> so, yeah, interesting. Um, so today, you know, from the, sh I did a show, a private party with Edward um, in 2013, the uh, CEO of, Fender, Larry Thomas, he's uh, golfing buddies with Eddie, they're pretty close. So he was having a thing called the Young Presidents Association get together, I guess. These different billionaires from around the world, they get together and just you know, host a party. And so at the party was Eddie Van Halen playing, uh, Don Felder, Doyle Dykes, a few other players, and Kenny Wayne Shepherd. And I was part of the three piece house band. Tony Franklin from uh, Blue Murder called me, he's a dear friend. And uh, he said, you want to be part of the band, you know, and of course. So I'm playing at the same party as Eddie Van Halen. Get out of here, you know. And um, so that was an amazing day to meet Edward and, uh, you know, share a couple of stories. And I took a photo with him that day and I tried to track down the photographer and never got back to me. And uh, I emailed Larry Thomas, the CEO, and. And I knew somewhere there's a photo of us together. And two hours ago, I got the photo, right? I sent, the, sent it to you. So uh, it's amazing that that so happened cool. on social media. Yeah, I just received the photo. So, And uh, that day, basically what Edward was doing was just doing a Q&A with the audience. And it was like at a, I think it was at a Fender facility. So there was maybe 50 people there that are part of this young president's association. Um, and then, you know, Fender staff and, um, yeah, meeting Edward. I remember he said to me, he said, you know, and I might've told you this Craig on our podcast, but he said, you know, it's interesting. I get nervous before and after he goes, look, my hands are shaking, even though I'm already done playing and I couldn't believe it, you know? And what I take away from that is, wow, he sure didn't seem nervous up there. I mean, once he puts the guitar on, it just flows through him. But it must be difficult to fill those shoes of the legend that he created. You know, I can't imagine. Uh, so that was an interesting story for me. And I couldn't help but think it, I should be the one that should be nervous. I have to play after him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and before him. And, oh, Christ. But uh, what an amazing day. So. Got on, man. Thank you. Yeah. You know, uh, there's so many moments that I remember of, of his playing. When I heard Eruption, I thought I couldn't understand what was happening. You know, I just started playing guitar and I didn't see the videos of him tapping or any of this, but I just heard the, the notes going in different directions. And, and it was, it stunned me. I was like, okay, this is too much. <laughs> and I go back to it and listen and, you know, he gave us so many gifts throughout the years. Every time they came out with a record, you know, and then the next record, Spanish Fly, and like, wow, listen to that guitar part. When I heard the intro to Mean Streets, I thought this is the single greatest guitar moment I've ever heard in my life, like the greatest intro ever, you know? Um, so, yeah, he's just the gift that keeps on giving, and he's the soundtrack to so many people's lives, you know? And it's really, um, when somebody passes away and you don't even know them, but they're part of your life, it's, uh, you know, we're all kind of mourning and trying to heal together. I've talked to friends that are crying themselves to sleep, you know? And uh, it was refreshing to see on social media that every single post from every single person that I ever have come across are all talking about the greatness that is Eddie Wood Van Halen and the band and the legacy and the legend and, you know, the pick slides and the phase 
yeah, phase 90 and the Echo Plex and jumping off the speaker cabinets. And, you know, he was our superhero. And you never imagine him dying because he just played with so much fire and so much life and so much energy. It's just like, it's devastating. I remember a buddy texted me the other day. He goes, dude, he was my Superman, you know? He goes, I've never, uh, yeah, uh, an old student of mine reached out to me, said, he goes, it's strange. I feel, I've never felt this way about somebody dying that I've never met, you know? So it's, uh, it's an incredible legacy. You know, I don't even know that Edward realizes how many people he touched. Probably blows his mind, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. It's just amazing. You know, and reading different stories about um, Ted Templeman being in the studio, walking by the second studio when they switched during the first record. And Eddie's just warming up with eruption. And he said to Don, he said, are you hearing this? And Don says, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm rolling tape. And then Ted asked, you know, Edward what he was playing. And then they, you know, brought Alex, or Alex and uh, Mike back in to do some hits and record it. And Eddie said, yeah, I could have done it better. Let me do another take. And Ted was like, no, we have it. It's done. You know, I just read that story and it blew my mind. It's like the single greatest guitar solo in history. And they just happened to be walking by the studio and they captured it. I mean, these things just blow your mind. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, man. It's... I mean, we, you know, you could ask me the question of what's your favorite solos. And it's, there's so many. Push comes to shove, you know. There's a little bit of Ellen Holsworth in there, but it's so like greasy and slinky and sexy. You know? Very sexy. That's a good word yeah. for that song. Yeah. I remember uh, recently Doug Rappaport said to me, we, cause we would play backstage Van Halen and ACDC Bon Scott era right before we go on stage. That was, I'm always DJing backstage and before, you know, 30 minutes before we go on, we play Van Halen and Rappaport says to me, he goes, you know, every note was perfect in his playing and that's just you know mind-blowing every single note every pick slide was epic the end of every song the way he got feedback right before they did the final hit you know it's just amazing and uh you know three guitar players come to mind when i think about capturing the live feeling in the studio edward for sure stevie ray vaughn gary moore they didn't have that red light mic, you know, recording syndrome. They really sounded like they were playing live in the studio because they were, but really like minimal or no overdubs, you know, no punching in. I think I hear one punch in and feel your love tonight, but that's probably about it. You know, there might've been a few little things, but he's basically just, you know, Edwards on the, uh, the left side, reverbs on the right, live in the studio. Okay, let's go. You know, I don't think kids even understand the concept of that because they can record in Logic, GarageBand, or Pro Tools. And you make a mistake, you back up your punch in, you fix it, you can tweak it, you can mask it. You know, it's just amazing to think about. Truly, truly uh, one of a kind. And it'll never, you can't, you can't reach the, that height like he did, I don't think, again. <laughs> if somebody does, you know, they'll be the next guy, but Man, he just took it to a new level. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron McLean. I'm the lead guitarist and music director for Air Supply. I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe and staying creative. Um, I'm just here to talk to you about the influence that Eddie Van Halen had on my life as a guitar player. And um, when I first heard Eddie's playing, I was just floored. I became a super fan, like literally. I remember I was working a summer job at a park and I heard a band across the street in their garage practicing and they were working on Ain't Talking About Love. And that, that little riff right there, that really caught my ear. And I know, I think I, I know I heard the song before on KLOS at the time. So I went home, I did some research and found out that it was Van Halen. So I ended up going to the music store, to the local music store to get the album, you know, and see what it was all about. So I still have my albums. I've got Van Halen 1, my vinyl, and of course, Fair Warning, sick, sick record. And of course, another fantastic album, Women and Children First. Eddie's Van, Eddie Van Halen's his guitar tone was just, just like no other. 
and his phrasing was just amazing as well and it just really kind of helped me understand uh, guitar phrasing and solo and soloing you know through his playing you know so I was really really heavily influenced by, by that you know um, I was such a fan that at about 14 or 15 I think I was at that age at the time Van Halen was coming through town and they were going to perform at the forum you know for the fair warning tour and I had to go so I told my mom I was like I need to get tickets and so I actually went to that concert by myself you know and yeah check out right and um, I remember checking out that concert man it's like in this you know just watching the guys just throw it down on stage and I was like I knew that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life and you know and I just kept on going I never really looked back and so when I was taking my guitar lessons I would learn as many Van Halen songs as I could um, and so the rest was history and I've always been a fan and I'm really really sad you know, as we all are, to see Eddie Van Halen go, and I know that he had such a heavily in a heavy impact on um, on the music industry and on us as musicians, and he will be greatly missed. So, my condolences to the Eddie Van Halen family. Thank you, Eddie, so much for your influence and being who you were and who you are, and your legacy and your music will live on. All right, cheers. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Hi, I'm Steve Morse, and I'd like to talk a little bit about Eddie Van Halen. He was a mighty guitarist, a mighty songwriter, and one of the most inventive rhythm players I've ever heard. I luckily got a chance to work with him for a few days. We were both endorsing Music Man, and uh, Albert Lee, of course, also was, and we, we had a band called Biff Baby's All-Stars. It's start, started by Sterling Ball. And it, some of his brothers were playing and singing in the band originally. And uh, John Ferraro and Jimmy Cox, just great session musicians. So it was just, you know, one of these things where you couldn't go wrong. The feel was going to be there. The, the thing is, you know, can you step up and, and, and keep up with them? I always enjoyed doing that gig. And... Uh, you know, at that point, I, I'd played a number of gigs with him and, and, and knew what the deal was. But Eddie came in cold, just like, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And, you know, we're doing country, two-step, uh, country, or western swing and uh, rockabilly, and then getting on into into a lot of rock sections, too, where, where the solo was pretty much a straight rock and roll. And that's, that's where, of course, Eddie, you know, blew the doors off the place when he did that stuff but on the stuff he wasn't uh, as comfortable with he was very original and inventive with uh, coming up with ways of uh, following the change you know to the arpeggiated uh, two-handed uh, and the t and tapping uh, bending the like taking harmonics and bending with the whammy bar and, you know, just using his ear. He had great ears. So, anyway, I just wanted to say a few words about how I, I got to, you know, stand next to him and, and play for a few days and really experience, you know, how, how the breadth of his talent. We had a lot in common. We sat and, and talked a lot during that time. Uh, you know, we're almost exactly the same age and both were having our only sons being born in, in a pot, you know, in a matter of months apart. So it was it was kind of surreal and uh, very sad to hear of his death. It, you know, death is coming for all of us, but uh, I guess the main thing to remember about Van Halen is what he contributed to the worldwide music vocabulary and some very great songwriting too and of course the solo we had a lot in common we sat and, and talked a lot during that time uh, you know we're almost exactly the same age and both were having our only sons being born in, in a pot you know in a matter of months apart so it was it was kind of surreal and uh, very sad to hear of his death. 
it, you know, death is coming for all of us. But uh, I guess the main thing to remember about Van Halen is what he contributed to the worldwide music vocabulary and some very great songwriting, too. And of course, the solo, incredible. And if we're sorry you're gone, and uh, everyone feels very sad about it. But you've, Eddie, you've got to be proud of the legacy you've, you've given the world and uh, help redefine the guitar technique library, as well as read some amazing tunes. Hey everybody, this is Nick Perry from Nick Perry and the Underground Thieves, formerly of the band Silvertide. Um, I'd like to thank Craig uh, for the opportunity to be a part of this tribute video to the late, great Eddie Van Halen. Um, I had the incredible, incredible honor uh, of opening the 2004 Van Halen reunion tour with Sammy Hagar, my band at the time, Silvertide. We got the phone call of a lifetime, and before we knew it, we were out on the road. I think we did, we didn't do the whole tour, but, but we did 30 shows, or maybe it was 40 shows opening um, across the US and Canada. So this is about 16 years ago. I was a kid, I was 20 years old, 19 or 20, when, when we got that call. And I'll share a few stories if you'd like to hear um, the, you know, the best that I can remember. So I think off the top of my head, a really good one was, was just having met. So we showed up on site and you know, our crew is doing their job and you know, our tour manager is getting the passes sorted and everything else and we get into the dressing room and we're not expecting to interact with anybody you know, for quite a while. Uh, but five minutes later, Eddie Van Halen shows up in our dressing room. He's chatting, he's got a guitar on, he's wearing sneakers with the red and white stripes, red, black, and white stripes. Uh, he's got a Wolfgang guitar on. And he's in the room, hanging out, talking with us, having a drink, you know. Next thing I know, like, you know, we're soldering the pickups in my Firebird. <laughs> and it was just like meeting an old friend instantly, even though he didn't know us at all. And I remember he came up to me, and again, I did not know this man. I mean, I knew him as a hero of mine, obviously, but I didn't know him as a person. And I just remember he came up very close to my face, and he asked me in his gravelly, low voice, what was my favorite record at that time? What was I listening to at that time? And I said, which was the truth at that time, my favorite record at that moment was ACDC Power Edge. And he smiled at me. He was like almost a little taken back and then smiled and then kissed me on both cheeks and said, I want you to meet me in my tuning room every day at whatever time, 3 p.m. or whatever he said, I don't, I don't remember. And uh, so I come to find out, number one, I think this is well publicized, that Eddie Van Halen's favorite guitar player is Clapton. But I did not know that his favorite band was ACDC and one of his favorite guitar players of all time is Angus Young. And it, that was just so cool to me to know that Eddie Van Halen looked up to Angus Young. So um, I guess I gave the right answer because I got, I got the golden ticket. So from that moment on, every night of the tour, I would go into this room called the tuning room, which was essentially a locker room. Keep in mind, these are arenas. So all the dressing rooms are essentially like uh, sports teams, like locker rooms. So there was a, you know, a production office. Each member of Van Halen had their own room. As support, we had our own dressing room. And then there was another room dedicated to what, you know, they said tuning room. I, no one knew what it was. But when I opened the door, it was essentially just an empty locker room with two guitar amps and a bunch of guitar stands. And I came to find out that was so Eddie could, you know, whoever he was going to buddy buddy up with on the tour, go in there and jam and play guitar. I had no idea that was going to be me. But for the next 30 days, I got to sit and, and play one-on-one -on -one with him in the tuning room. We jammed a lot of blues. We jammed a lot of ACDC. We were playing ACDC riffs, and, and it was just like mind-blowing stuff because I, like most of my peers, grew up absolutely loving this man and his musical contributions. And if I had never met him, he already would have changed my life. As a kid, uh, I remember going to Blockbuster Video and renting Live Without a Net on VHS and wearing a hole in the VHS tape. I, I watched it so many times. Then I'd go back to Blockbuster, rent it again, duplicate it, and keep watching. <laughs> so he had already changed my life, but 
to have the opportunity to tour with him and to know him as a person, he, the, the biggest takeaway for me was that he was a kind and gentle soul and would give you the shirt off his back and he was immediately warm. You met him and he immediately, you know, if you were a likable person, he liked you. So uh, I just remember his smile and how warm he was and how he would always put his arm around me and, and uh, I was his friend, you know, for, for, for those 30, 40 dates, you know, we were, we were brothers and I, I missed that time. And certainly knowing that he has passed on, it's been a very tough week. But I feel grateful to have had that opportunity and um, I'll never forget it. So thank you, Ed. Love you, buddy. Godspeed. See you in the next realm. And thank you for having me, Craig. Everybody loves guitar. Uh, Nick Perry signing off. Hey guys, Doug Rappaport here with the Edgar Winter Band. And uh, I'm going to try and do a video here on what Eddie Van Halen means to me. Difficult to do in a single setting. Um, Edward has passed. My heart is broken. Um, you know, I'm going to try and get through this. Be cool. Anyway, <laughs> Eddie, um, I've known about Eddie. Seems like he's been part of my consciousness for my whole life. I mean, I don't remember not knowing about Eddie Van Halen. I remember I went to a small alternative school in West LA and it was a K through 12 school. And I just remember the big kids were, you know, arguing all the time about who was better, Randy or Eddie. And uh, they'd really go at it sometimes. And it seemed to me growing up as a guitar player, you fell into either the Randy Rhodes camp or the Eddie Van Halen camp, if you were a rock guitar player. And I fell decidedly and wholly into the uh, Eddie Van Halen camp. Um, every note he played, his songs, his picking, his everything, every note, every nuance, I just absorbed and listened to uh, with care, with reverence, with joy. Um, he could move me across the spectrum of emotion um, in a single sitting, you know? I mean, to this day, when I hear that first pinch harmonic in the solo for um, Mean Street, and my throat closes, man. My throat closes, my chest squeezes, and my eyes well up. It's just like, it's so intense, you know? It just, nothing moves me like Van Halen, like Eddie Van Halen. And, um, yeah. The last time I saw Van Halen was about five or six years ago for Father's Day. My wife got me tickets to see them at the Staples Center. And uh, it was a great show. And I could tell that Eddie was struggling a little. It was the last show of the tour and he was, uh, he was struggling. Not playing badly, but I could just see he was having to really dig. And it was kind of confirmed when Alex was doing his drum solo and I was in a place in the audience I could sort of peer around the back and I could see Eddie was over there just sneezing and blowing his nose and he was not feeling well. And uh, then he did Eruption and he did his guitar solo and, and uh, he put his face on the jumbo screen. You could just see he was digging so deep and, you know, fighting, fighting for every note. And sometimes when you have to fight like that, you can pull out stuff that you don't usually pull out. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, you can really find another gear. And he did. And he did. And he did it because he was determined to. You know what I mean? He was giving everything. And it was an eruption, you know, which to me is the greatest 90 seconds of music ever. It's the greatest, most important guitar playing ever. Um, anyway, he finished playing and I just dropped. I was just spent. I just dropped into my chair and uh, I started just bawling because it was so beautiful. 
Um, and it was, it was like, that was my life, man. That's, that was my trajectory. It was right there. He played my, he played my life, uh, You know, you could sum up my life in those notes. Anyway, that's all I got for now. Uh, I could go on and on about Eddie Van Halen, but he's the greatest of all time, my biggest hero. One other story I'll tell you is I did a podcast not too long ago, and I was asked who the greatest top three guitar players were. And I said, well, one through 10 is Eddie Van Halen. Now we could talk about 11, 12, and 13 if you want. So <laughs> that's how I feel. That's for real. Um, anyway, sad. God bless you, Eddie. God bless. Peace. This is Alex Skolnick, and um, Eddie Van Halen meant so much. Uh, hands down, my favorite favorite of so many. So um, the thing I was just playing there, this is something that I think doesn't get talked about enough. Um, the innovations he did with bends, right? Like that's from "You Really Got Me," and you know the common bend that we do, kind of you know that originated with Chuck Berry, you might say. Right? He does it up a fret. Right? And then there's that huge bend. Right? I had never heard anybody do that before. I'm I'm not aware of anybody doing that before him. And um, I haven't heard many folks do it since. Um, it's hard to do. <laughs> and he does it so smoothly. And that's just like one little thing. Um, you know, there's so much more, and I like to, you know, focus on these things that don't get talked about as much with Eddie. Um, another one is when he goes across the strings, um, using the same pattern, right? Like, this shouldn't work, for example, but this, this is a common thing that shows up in a bunch of songs, like taking uh, a three-note pattern on a string. <laughs> Right, just like a part of a scale. Right, just this part. But just moving that. Right, I'm the one. Um, later in I'm the one. Right, it shows up a few times. Um, jump. Right, so it's always the same lick, but it doesn't sound the same because he ingeniously reuses it, but you wouldn't guess. Like, the the way he does it in Jump, it starts on the upbeat, and it's following these other licks that just don't seem to have any... Um, they don't seem like they would lead into that lick, yet it's... That's why it hits so hard, you know, you just... You don't expect that to happen at all. So, yeah, the um, symmetrical patterns, um, as well as the, the big bends. And, of course, the, you know, the harmonics. So this one... Um, right? That's, that shows up in, in I'm the One. Somebody get me the doctor. Yeah. Who did that? I know, um, you know, Jocko Pistorius did some stuff like that on bass. And um, it showed up in jazz fusion, but as far as like hard rock, especially like good time hard rock, I mean, who did that? And, um, you know, that's like not even talking about the thing everybody <laughs> talks about, you know, which is the, the two-handed stuff, which is wonderful and amazing. And I, I think in the two-handed stuff, you see a lot of that same idea where he goes, um, well, this is from Spanish Fly, but played on electric. Right. It's just going across the strings, taking the same pattern. 
Uh, musically, that really sh that shouldn't work as well as it does because he's but he's just breaking the rules. He would constantly break rules. I mean, I you know I can't think of anybody else like this. And it applied to the songs too. There were all, all kinds of like little noises in the songs. Um, the first time I heard anybody do uh, volume swells, um, you know, somebody get me a doctor. <laughs> I had never heard that. That's a common thing now. Um, and just, yeah, the instrument. So I'm, I'm actually playing a guitar that is uh, built by a friend of mine, uh, Frankie Felitas, and uh, he built me this. And I've played the limited edition $25,000 versions of Eddie's guitar, and this plays as good or better. Um, and he copied a lot of the details, too. So you can look at it and really get an idea of like what an original Eddie was, especially in the mid to late 70s. And this is the result of an experiment, you know, because he liked the way Strat-type guitars played, but he liked the way um, Les Pauls and other humbucker-type guitars sounded. So he just really crammed a humbucker into a Strat style guitar and that's basically what this is and it's awesome how you know it just it, the wiring refl it reflects his uh you know the, the fact that you know he wasn't professional at this yet the fact that he could do it and he could do it well enough to just get a, an incredible sound a revolutionized sound was amazing and you know you yeah you look at the guitar or you know some i've seen his his actual guitar on display at the met and, um, yeah, you just look at it, right, there's a, a, a coin in there. Yeah, his has, has a quarter. Um, this one in the back is pretty simple, but the original has, you know, bike reflectors. Per se. I mean, just what a um, outside-the-box thinker. So I just think that, you know, there's so many things that get overlooked because he had these amazing uh, revolutionary guitar parts with two hands and it's understandable that that would get the lion's share of attention but there was so much more than that and uh, we're not even we haven't even gotten into you know his sound and you know using overdrive the way he did and it just still sounds so fresh um, his tone, you know, screams um, off of the out of the speakers uh, to this day. I mean, there's, you know, it's just it still sounds as fresh as ever. A lot of his innovations are much more common now. Two-handed tapping is much more common as you know as a lot of the other stuff. Um, a Strat-style guitar with humbuckers is quite common. Um, and just, you know, so many things that he did that just hadn't been done. And it's incredible. This all came from one person. So, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on about Eddie. <laughs> um, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of others have a lot to say. So I'm going to let others say what they say. But um, this is Al Skolnick. And uh, Craig, thanks for having me on. And uh, a big toast to Eddie Van Halen. Cheers. Hey, this is Steve Stevens, from Billy Idol primarily. Um, I've been asked to say some things about Eddie Van Halen or, and um, it's a little bit difficult to know where to start because um, myself, like everyone else, had that first experience of of hearing the very first, uh, for me, it was the very first Van Halen record, the debut. I was at a party, everybody was really drunk. It was one of those parties. And uh, the record had just come out. I was already in a band. I was in a cover band playing Long Island. Uh, and uh, I was playing the same clubs and the scene with Twisted Sister and all that. And uh, I was at a party and someone put on the, the, uh, the record. And when it got, obviously, for us guitar players, when it got to eruption, bolted across the room to the turntable. I lifted the needle off and I said to the guy who, whose party it was, 
what, who is, who is that? Oh, it's this new band, Van Halen. What, that, that's a guitar? Put that back on. So we put them, move the needle, and I put back on Eruption, I listened to it, and I spent the remainder of the, of the party listening to the record, and it was life-changing, and it was one of those few instances where a debut record has a meteoric effect like Hendrix's debut, like Led Zeppelin's debut, like Sabbath. And, um, you know, Ed left us with uh, such a vast amount of music and styles and what he did for the guitar community and passing off his knowledge uh, as, as an innovator and inventor not these are the these are the real guys the guys like les paul and, and eddie and hendrix and i do believe that ed's legacy will be remembered in the same breath as Jimi hendrix and but he passed off on us all of this knowledge and it was funny because you hear the stories about when he was first doing tapping and he turned around so nobody could see it but once that record came out and there he was like yeah loud and proud this is what i do and it's almost like he introduced a new technique and a new style with every record. He never sat on his laurels. And I got to be friends with Ed, as many musicians and guitarists uh, and the guitar community, I'm sure, will attest to. He was generous to a fault. I toured with him when I was with Vince Neil opening, and um, he arranged for, gave me guitars right off his guitar rack and arranged for amplified. I mean, it. It just goes on and on and every, I will say that every experience that I had with Ed was a party. It was fun. It was never a bummer or a drag or it was never about the business. We never talked business. It was always about guitars and have you heard this? And, um, you know, and uh, we had a lot of shared experiences and, um, and that friendship, um, you know, lasted up until the last time I saw him, which was in Australia. I was playing with a, an all-star band, and it was just uh, maybe Kings of Chaos. It was just great to see Ed again. And um, um, it's beyond words, but his legacy is it will grow and grow. I've seen this. I'm old enough to see this with 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 Hendrix and guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan and. Um, and, and um, I, I know that his music and his legacy are in great hands with Wolfie. And uh, I'd like to shout out to Matt Brock, who was Ed's personal assistant. Um, the two of them were like such gentlemen to me. And um, I will miss Ed. I think he's in a better place. As we all know, he was sick for a while. And, but boy, what a incredible amount of music that he's left us with. And uh, kids will still, guitar players and kids will be listening to Eddie Van Halen for the next 100, 200 years. I mean, it's, he's that kind of artist. Love you, Ed. Glad I could say a couple of words about you. Safe travels, buddy. Hey, I'm Brian Young, formerly of the David Lee Roth Band, currently of the COVID Palooza lockdown. Anyways, uh, I started playing guitar in 1977 and uh, about a year I was into Led Zeppelin. Uh, Jimmy Page was my favorite guitar player. And then about a year later, out comes this album by a band called Van Halen with Eddie Van Halen on guitar. And he just, the, my first reaction was I was very upset because I didn't want anybody, anybody to be better than Jimmy Page. And Eddie Van Halen came along and it was just, smoking everybody out of the gate. So uh, first of all, anyone who's m from my generation will remember that everyone was trying to figure out how the heck is he doing it? That space age, it sounded like something from the future, from outer space, uh, it sounded like a science fiction movie, that sound at the end of eruption. And uh, I could figure out the notes, but I was trying to play it like this, and I'm, what the heck? And a friend of mine told me that uh, he had seen Van Halen before they got big, and Eddie had put his finger up here on the neck. And that was the key. And I learned how to do this tapping thing. And I was like the first guy in, the, in my town doing it. It was pretty cool. So anyways, this is like 78. And every year when the new Van Halen record came out, it was always exciting. Everyone was waiting to hear what's Eddie gonna do because you know he's gonna do something new and exciting and innovative. 
So that was another cool thing about Van Halen. There was always excitement. It was everybody was waiting to hear what's Eddie going to do next because, you know, first he does the eruption, and then the next album he has Spanish Fly, where it's kind of like eruption on a nylon string guitar, and then um, the tapping on the beginning of Mean Street, all these cool things. So it was really exciting. It was a really exciting time for musicians or for guitar players, rock guitar players. And I moved to LA in 80, 83. And uh, at this time, everyone, it's all about the tone. I mean, yeah, sure, Eddie Van Halen wasn't the first guy to, to, to do the tapping, but nobody cared before he did it. It became, uh, millions of people did it after he did it because of the way he did it. And then he wasn't the first guy to put a humbucker in a strat, but nobody cared before he did it. And then after he did it, the guitar of the 80s was the super strat a strat style body with a humbucker and a tremolo that was that was just the guitar of the 80s and uh and it also it inspired all these um, other guitar players to to take it to another level like i always considered uh there's pre-eddie guitar players and post-eddie guitar players you could tell the guys that started playing in the 70s they have a different style the three finger blues riffs and then with when the eddie came out it seemed like more guitar players were getting more into getting their technique together, using all their fingers, playing more melodic scales. And you know, of course, hyper speed was a big thing. Then guys coming out like, you know, Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, all these amazing technical players really uh, opened up the world of just guitar virtuosity. And, uh, and the tone, Eddie's tone was amazing. He was coming out, I mean, all of a sudden, amp guys in LA were all trying to modify amps, trying to get the Eddie Van Halen sound. It was everything about it. He, you know, he really changed the whole universe of rock guitar, guitar tone, guitar design. And then, same once again, he wasn't the first guy probably to custom paint a guitar. But after he did it, every company came out with guitars with stripes and polka dots and this and that. So uh, everything about guitar changed when Eddie Van Halen came out. He was definitely the the one who changed the world. And then I got the honor of playing with David Lee Roth and playing the Van Halen songs and really having to dial in all those riffs that he did. And uh, when you're listening to another thing about Eddie Van Halen, besides his amazing solos, his rhythm, he's such in the pocket, he swings like nobody else. And uh, he puts little riffs in between throughout the song and uh, the, you'll learn a song and then a year or two later you'll listen to it again and you'll go oh, I didn't notice this and you'll find out these other little things he did and then another year or two later oh wow I didn't notice that you know nowadays everything's online so you can find it all but in those days you were discovering it a little bit at a time because you just had the record you know to listen to so uh, to learn all the little intricate things uh, and hear what they were he was doing was so cool so it made it so much fun to it was super fun to play those songs on stage with Dave's voice behind it. So that was an amazing experience. And uh, anyways, Eddie Van Halen was definitely the king of rock and roll guitar like no other. And uh, we will all miss him greatly.